The opening sequence of episode 15 sees the return of Armin's narration, which, as we've seen before, of course marks another turning point in history. Functionally, it's just a truncated recap of the Tribunal, with Aaron telling them to shut up and bet everything on him. Which just neatly establishes his role as the now primary player in the upcoming mission. And the title, Special Ops Squad, is also self-explanatory this time around. Out of the season as a whole, these couple of episodes we'll be covering today are largely set up and lore drop ones. So we're just going to be meeting the new and expanded core cast, as well as looking forward to the bigger story to come. Moving into the episode itself, however, this one starts off with a whole bunch of build-up, so we will be going through it a bit faster than usual. But this is of course still Attack on Titan, so there is a huge throughline here which we'll get to momentarily. As for the former HQ, first off, while they do talk about how it turned out to be impractical for the scouts, I also think you could take it to be implicitly telling us that because of the absurdly high death rate of the scouts, they simply don't need multiple headquarters and ones of this size. There simply aren't that many of them at any single point in time. On top of that, the whole it being impractical because of how far away from the walls it is, is another example of us being shown how drastically differently the scouts think about this sort of stuff. For the MPs, for example, it was all about getting into Walsina, aka literally as far away as possible from the Titans. Whereas for the scouts, they want even their HQ to be as close to the outer wall as possible. It just reminds us that, for them, venturing and basically living beyond the wall is essentially the norm. And lastly, we of course also see that Levi is watching Aaron like a hawk. Which just sets up the whole angle of Aaron being surrounded by literally the strongest fighters of the walls, who are all ready to pounce on him at any given moment. And another thing we see here is the beginning of the whole Oluo biting his tongue gag which will be repeated a number of times later on. And because I don't want to be annoying as I have literally no clue how you properly pronounce Oluo as a name without sounding odd, I'm just going to keep calling him the tongue biting guy. Just like I mentioned with Mike and his Jojo tendency to smell people, I do think this whole character gimmick is just meant to lighten the mood a little, but I do think it's something that does somewhat stick out in retrospect considering just how dark the series gets later on. As we make it to the HQ, the series further builds up the scouts as these absolute legends. As we see Aaron name off each of their stats, almost as if they were some sort of playing cards or his own personal favorite Fortnite players. Oh my god, I just became the how do you do fellow kids meme. So far, the fight against the titans has been all about survival. In most cases, it's not even a case of landing a killing blow so much as it is about just surviving the encounter. But here, we see that we are so far and away above just survival that they can track their kills and almost gamify the entire process. And of course, Aaron also spells this out himself, but it is also another reminder of what will happen to him if anything goes wrong. They may be his protectors, but they are also his executioners. This also marks the beginning of the ever-famous Levi cleaning meme where we see that cleanliness might just be about the only thing which he gets even more serious about than slain titans. In the same vein, Petra then walks in and expands on this a little more, saying that Aaron must be somewhat surprised and disappointed by who Levi really is. First off, that angle of her saying that everyone in the scouts not only follows his orders, but also sort of embodies him even so far as to address people in the same manner, I think further contrasts what we've seen with higher-ups thus far. That petrified dude whose name I also can't pronounce was just that. Petrified, and only spouting out orders that wouldn't put himself in any immediate danger. Pixis, while clearly exhibiting empathy for what they're going through, also took a bit of a more staunch approach in giving bigger picture orders, and not really getting into the nitty gritty himself. Levi, and of course also Irvin on the other hand, are the absolute definition of leading by example. And I think this is just that. Showing us that at the core of this whole unit, there is immense mutual trust and respect. An absolute far cry from the scattered units we saw in Trost. Secondly, I also really like the angle of Aaron being disappointed in his view of Levi. Of course, the whole don't meet your idols saying is a saying for a reason. But especially in a setting like Attack on Titan, where these scouts are sort of held up as the heroes of humanity, I think that wake-up call of them also just being human with their own quirks and shortcomings is just a great touch. Also get it? Shortcomings? Because Levi is short? Wait, canonically the dude is basically the same height as me. Well... And lastly, the whole cleanliness angle and the ambiguity of Levi's past is also teased here by Petra. 
As I've briefly mentioned before, originally, Levi's backstory was a bit of a mystery, and with him becoming a fan favorite almost right away, clearly people wanted to know more. Luckily for us though, this entire angle is fully explained in the 100% canon OVAs. So drawing from that, this germophobia becomes pretty self-explanatory. He grew up in terrible conditions, so now he is yo-yoed a little and cleanliness has almost become an obsession. Again, if you've never seen the OVAs, I 100% recommend watching them, even if for the animation alone. Cutting to Mika and Irvin, however, we now move right into the next huge story beats. As Mike immediately picks up on something about the supposed plan of Irvin's seeming off, going as far as to call him out for not even trusting him. Not to repeat myself a hundred times throughout this video, we'll get to this in just a second. Though as we cut to the scouts, we effectively hear the same sentiment repeated, with them too wondering about why new recruits will be joining them so soon. And if it still wasn't clear enough, Levi then explicitly says, I am sure he's thinking much further ahead than us. Pretty blatantly saying, yeah, Irvin's plan clearly has some other goal and this entire deal is no more than a stepping stone to a far bigger plan. So, up until now, it's clear that the scouts at least are more than aware of something more going on that for one reason or another, they're not being let in on just yet. Still with the scouts, naturally they then turn to Aaron to ask him about his transformations and how this entire power even works. To which he responds by saying that he doesn't know how it exactly works, but he does know that it is activated when he bites his hand or his arms. And it's as he says this that he realizes that, wait, why do I know this? This is exactly what we talked about back in Trost during his first transformations. Without a shadow of a doubt, he immediately went to chomp down on his hand as if it was pure instinct. Though like I mentioned there, now we know that this way of transforming isn't nearly as common, with basically every other shifter more often than not using different means to transform. And then, as we delve into the memories of the founder, we'd of course see exactly where this biting the hand technique comes from. None other than Frida Rice. Though, as they're talking, everyone's favorite mad genius Hanji barges through the doors and immediately everyone is just like, nah, we're out. Clearly implying that they've heard all about Hanji's experiments, hypotheses and everything in between a million times already. And it's Eren that has now fallen into the endless abyss that is Hanji's stories. This whole thing is effectively one big lore dump, much of which does seem trivial in hindsight, but there are also some super interesting tidbits in here. First off, she tells Eren a whole long story about how she named Sonny and Bean, the two titans that are now being kept for experiments. The story is about this clan of cannibals, their leader, etc, etc. And as much as this is sold as a in-universe story, it is actually a real-life account slash legend slash amalgamation of stories. The story goes that a man by the name of Sonny Bean led a 45-member clan in Scotland that often engaged in, let's say, experimental cuisines of their fellow man. <laughs> It is still unclear whether these stories have any real-life merit or not, so feel free to read up on it in detail if you're curious. Also, her two previous titans named Alberto and Chikachironi are also referencing real-life people, with Alberto likely being a reference to Albert Fish, a serial killer in the 20th century, and Chikachironi potentially being a reference to a Russian serial killer named Andrei Chikatoli, I guess, or maybe Chikatilo, I don't really know. So the TLDR here is that these are not entirely random ramblings and they are actually based on some real life lore as well. I do suppose with the benefit of hindsight and us clearly knowing that, in actuality, the world of Attack on Titan takes place around the 20th century rather than the 1700s and 1800s we see within the walls, you could also make an argument that all of these stories she tells is a hint toward that exact fact. Based on our understanding of the walls as they stand right now, the people she mentions wouldn't even exist yet. But again, we of course now know that the rest of the world is far further ahead, and it is only Paradis that is still stuck in the 1800s, meaning that these people could have technically existed and somehow these stories might have reached Paradis. While I do think it's a bit of a stretch, knowing Isayama, I don't think it's too far out of the range of possibility. Returning to Hanji's experiments though, she mentions that when cut off from light, the titans become dormant. Something we wouldn't have to wait long to see firsthand as the walls were cracked open, so more on that soon. Another thing that I found interesting here is that Hanji does actually have a lot of empathy for the titans. 
Sure, the Titans do seem to be natural predators for humanity. But when they're nailed down and just sitting there, I think it's natural for a researcher to begin questioning their own actions, no matter how righteous they may technically be. And especially now that we know these are actually people, perhaps there is some sort of primal understanding there that she is hurting her own kind. Though the big thing here is of course the last thing she says, saying that she once kicked a Titan out of the way and he was as light as a feather. Saying that, up until that point, she used rage and hatred to fight the Titans. But at that very moment, she realized that there is something absolutely fundamental that they do not understand at all. Again, with the benefit of hindsight, we of course know that this is because the Titans are natural beings or anything like that. And their origin is Emir who creates them within the paths. So clearly, they won't abide by normal laws of physics. So for me, this is just that. Hanji realizing that the way they've been fighting so far is missing a crucial angle that may completely flip the board upside down. Because if the Titans don't even function by basic laws of physics, what else might they learn? Though the very last thing we see here, I think is deliberately there to subvert everything we just heard. As Eren asks Hanji to tell him absolutely everything. But as we skip to the next morning, we immediately see that he already knew all of it. He was covered in basic training. Which to me, says just that. We think we know a lot, but really, we know next to nothing. Even the scouts haven't found anything new. Which, I think just neatly sets up all the mysteries we'd be uncovering ourselves. As for the mid-cards, these talk about the very creatively named Wall Religion. Last time, we saw that clown during the tribunal, but of course, the purpose of the Wall Religion and it trying to make sure that the walls remain intact does technically serve a purpose. Like, you know, this small thing of accidentally not starting the rumbling? But at the same time, that same deceit also creates a huge information disparity that would prove extremely dangerous, just like we'd see at the end of the season. We'll get to it plenty more soon, but the TLDR here is that, just like with any power, the wall religion is just a sign of corruption within the walls that might have started as a righteous goal of not accidentally starting the rumbling, but has now become no more than a power grab fueled by irrational decisions made by the terrified population of the walls. Though it's then that an alarm is sounded because Hanji's loyal titan buddies have been slain. Of course, for us there is no more mystery here. The scouts were outside of the walls, so this was just the Marley squad quickly snubbing out any potential for further Titan research. Especially with Aaron now on their side, whose shifter status they are of course fully aware of. Though the big thing here is of course the scene we get between Irvin and Aaron. First off, notice the complete tonal shift that happens as Irvin leans over Aaron's shoulder. That grander than life, almost biblical music kicks in, immediately making you question just what are we seeing here? And then that question of, who do you think the enemy is? Just leaves you asking a million questions as to what exactly is he even talking about. This is a scene that has sparked countless discussions throughout the years, and even now I've heard people wonder about what exactly did Irvin mean here. And to me, there is only one explanation, and it's one we've already been hinted at, as well as we'll continue to see dozens of times throughout the following episodes. Thus far, we've already seen many of the scouts question Irvin's true intentions with this mission, suspecting that this whole recruitment is being accelerated for some specific reason. Though here, Aaron has spent the entire night talking to Hanji, so our Titan Shifter human weapon has a concrete alibi and so purely to gauge his reaction, Irvin asks him this question, who do you think the enemy is? In my mind, this is him asking, is the enemy a human or a Titan? I think every single move he pulls both leading up to this point as well as in the episode to follow has only one single intention. To whittle down the number of suspects, then set up a honeypot and catch the person responsible because of a faulty piece of information planted by him. And to better illustrate that, let us move right into episode 16 and I'll explain exactly what I mean. The title of episode 16, What Needs to Be Done, is just as self-explanatory as the previous one with Jean saying these exact words when referring to his decision of joining the scouts. However, considering Irvin's actions in this episode, I think you could also use this little title to describe his actions. That is to say, all of his moves to deliberately alienate a large part of the recruits is a sacrifice that needs to be made in order to find out who's the sus one among us. Oh my god, I did it again. 
Moving into the episode itself, however, we see the inspection of their ODM gear with the hope of finding out if anyone has used theirs and could therefore be tied to the whole Sony and Bean debacle. Again, not to repeat it again, we'll tackle the whole ODM gear mystery once we actually get to it later in the season. But of course, in classic Attack on Titan fashion, every time we see them talk about it, Annie just so happens to be chilling in basically all of these scenes, almost as if to deliberately taunt us every single second on a rewatch. The one thing that I find particularly curious here is Armin explicitly saying they actually helped the Titans. Because yes, Armin, yes they did. Almost as if they were trying to stop Parody from learning more about the Titans, huh? Again, remember our old friend Chekhov, and keep in mind that someone explicitly sat down and decided to include such a line. So I think they're included to just frame this whole thing as not some act of revolution from within the walls, but deliberately painting it as a malicious act. Which of course is exactly what Irvin would pick up on as well as base all of his assumptions on. Though before we continue with the ODM gear, we get a brief flashback of the fire where all the fallen soldiers are being burned. In terms of grounding the story before everything to follow and reminding us of what we've already been through, I think this scene was excellent. First off, that moment of Jean picking up the bone and not even knowing whose it is just reminds us of the sheer number of people who died during the mission. And of course also depicts the bitter reality of how, more often than not, if you die out there, all that will be left behind is the memory of you and that is it. In Marco's case, it was obviously a safety precaution to avoid an epidemic. But for those venturing beyond the walls, well, it's likely they'll just be chilling in a Titan's stomach somewhere. Though secondly, I also think that this moment of regret and self-doubt is exactly what you would expect from people in such a scenario. Everyone here knows exactly what they've signed up for. And they also know full well that they are supposed to be the heroic soldier fighting for all of humanity. But at the core of all of that, they are still just regular people that are terrified out of their minds. Just like Levi's whole cleanliness which undermines his entire soldier persona, I think these human moments are ones that ultimately made all the big payoffs feel so earned. And of course, it's here where Jean channels that protagonist energy and says the episode's title, claiming that he will do what needs to be done. He fully admits that he isn't as reckless as Aaron who would blindly run into battle. He is still scared out of his mind, but he will be joining the scouts because it is what he believes he has to do. I'll sound like a broken record, but Jean's story throughout, and particularly with the events of the final season, feels like one that I would have never really seen coming. But because of scenes like these, that development feels extremely earned. He's not really your core core cast, but he is always there. So when he ends up emerging as one of the leads, it just feels so natural. He isn't your pure strength like Mikas or Levi, he isn't your brains like Irvin and Armin, he doesn't even have an explicit gimmick like Connie for example, but because he's always there and we get these sorts of developmental scenes with him, his presence there and his entire dynamic with everyone else in the group just feels extremely dynamic. Though of course, plenty more of that in the future. Though as we jump back to the ODM gear inspection, we see the opposite side of Jean's proclaimed selflessness, with Annie claiming that she still plans on joining the military police. Like we've talked about in past episodes, the reasoning here is relatively straightforward. MPs work within Walsina, they have access to the higher echelons of the walls and therefore can both influence as well as learn a lot more. Something that would sure be handy for a spy of Marley. They also have a brief conversation about what Armin would do if someone told him to die, which in this episode's context is of course about joining the scouts. Though, since this is coming from Annie, I think it's worth noting that she literally was told to go and die. Because of the curse of Emir, the moment Annie got her titan, she was destined to die. So in my mind, I don't think it's a stress to say that this is a case of her asking Armin a question she would have liked to ask herself in the past. Armin, however, says that he made up his mind a long time ago and he is joining the scouts. But he also notes that he thinks Annie is trying to protect them, almost as if she doesn't want them to join the scouts. We'd see this bizarre friendship of theirs play out very soon, and it would also be a major clue toward the female's titan identity as well. But yeah, she doesn't want them to join because Marley will have to stop the scouts, right? Though the final line Annie says is, I just want to save myself. Again, in the bigger story, this has been made very clear. As despite her upbringing, she ultimately just wants to make it back alive and reunite with her father. 
So in this case, she isn't lying. For her, staying alive really is the only goal. Though we then finally move into the enlistment ceremony where Irvin's big scheme is put into play. Irvin first builds up Aaron, saying that he is the key to fighting the Titans. But then he goes all in and says, not only that, he has also given us the chance to find out about the Titans' origin. And as if his intention wasn't clear enough, we blatantly focus on his eyes as we pause for a moment and watch him scan the crowd. From this point on, every single one of Irvin's actions are designed to bait a response. Someone killed the Titans. Aaron is a human who can transform into an intelligent Titan. There are two more intelligent Titans. Assuming they too are human, they have exhibited a clear motive to harm the walls. If that is the case, they likely killed the Titans to stop research into them. They used ODM gear, that means they are likely soldiers. If they are soldiers, they could be here. If they are here, they are trying to get even closer to Aaron. Therefore, I will lay out bait. And to sweeten the deal even more, he then adds that this key is in Aaron's basement. And surprise surprise, upon hearing which, we very conveniently jump to see Reiner's and Bertolt's reactions. Though speaking of the Marley duo, this of course also brings up the question of why don't they just go for Aaron's home here and now? Aaron clearly is the attack titan, one of the shifters Marley had lost. So it's entirely possible he has already accessed the memories of past users and knows something right? Well, I think the answer here is twofold. First off, practically speaking, Shiganshina is huge. As much as it may seem small when we get the bird's eye views, and to be fair, it also looks relatively small in the series, some quick napkin math based on the size of the walls tells you that Shiganshina is roughly 7.4 thousand square kilometers. That is more than five and a half Los Angeles and almost 10 New Yorks. So short answer, Titan or no Titan, even if they know exactly which house they were referring to, which they don't, just that it's under some rubble, traversing that territory would take a very, very long time. But to be fair, the depiction of Trost and Shiganshina we see in the series is clearly nowhere close to these numbers, right? I mean, sure, math tells us that it's this size, but when we actually see it, I mean, come on. But even despite that, I do still think that the point stands. It's not like it's a small village, it is still relatively big. And sure, technically there is probably a very small number of houses that are under this specific kind of rubble, but that then brings me onto hypothesis numero two. They might already suspect that this is just that. A honeypot waiting for its Winnie the Pooh. In fact, Armin says just that. As when we cut to him, he is straight up saying, he is revealing too much. Or is there something more? So to me, this is a case of, well, we are already undercover, so why don't we just tag along, go to Shiganshina, let's find the house, and then we will do what we need to do. And to let us stew on this idea a little bit, we then cut to the mid-cards talking about the faction selection. This one is just a repeat of what we already heard, talking about the selection between the MP, the garrison, and the scouts. But since the MPs are restricted to the top 10 and the scouts have, well, not the best safety record, the garrison is chosen most frequently. Which neatly leads us back to Irvin's speech, where now that very sweet honeypot has been set out and we now need to filter out the rest. He continues his speech by saying that over four years they've lost 60% of their soldiers, saying it is a horrifying number and he expects that most of the recruits will die in the next four years. So again, based on his assumptions, the mall is among these people. And to be totally honest, the move by Marley was kind of a misfire, as them going after the Titans might have even given this plan more credence as they clearly want to stop research into the Titans, something that Irvin can now explicitly use as bait. And so with that out there, he will go over and above to scare away as many people as possible to the point that one of the other scouts even tells him, Irvin, you've over-intimidated them. No one will be left. And that is exactly what we see, with us getting these shots of Jean, Sasha, and Connie all going against the figurative stream and standing there despite the almost certain death ahead of them. And again, notice how we never see Bertolt and Reiner because to them, it was never a decision to even consider. Of course they joined the scouts. With Annie and the MP, they have their insider there. So now, they just need to stay close to Aaron and decide whether or not they're going to yoink him. And with that, the first stage of Irvin's plan is complete. 
What's left are those who are the only ones capable of withstanding the pressure and actually have a chance of survival out there. But most importantly, among these few also lies the mole. Though I also love how the iconic dedicating your heart salute here is an absolute hodgepodge of emotions, just like I think it should be. Half of them are scared out of their minds, half of them are screaming, half of them are crying, but despite that, Irvin affirms that all of them have gained his respect. As much as I talk about all of these big picture things and the 3 million IQ writing we see in Attack on Titan, I think it's all of these small scenes that just make it, for lack of a better word, feel earned. Just like with the fire, it's these emotional peaks and valleys that make those climaxes carry weight. And with everything we've seen, them joining the scouts is clearly an absolute high. We then move into their training where Armin says that actual training was rather scarce and they mostly focused on formations. First off, I think this is another case of us being told just how differently scouts operate. It's not just immense strength and combat skill. It's these extremely optimized strategies that allow them to outwit their opponents rather than just outpower it. Something that is obviously a great asset when working in such small numbers. Though secondly, and most importantly, we hear that Aaron's position was never revealed. And then in later episodes, we'd of course learned that not only was his position withheld until the final moments, they were also given falsified information, giving a different position for each squad. So with the numbers now whittled down, Irvin baits the ball to make a move. Whichever position senses trouble, the corresponding squad can be immediately flagged as potentially containing the imposter. And with this little trial mission, all the pieces are in place for Irvin's big gamble to lure out the enemy. Though unfortunately for them, they'd soon learn that there is in fact another enemy that they haven't even met yet. But before we get to that, we cut back to the scout HQ where the rest of Aaron's buddies arrive and announce that they too are joining the scouts. Also side note, Mikasa calling Levi a shorty is pure gold. Though again, this is one of those sequences that I think manage the tone and emotion really really well. Aaron learns of Marco's death, which of course puts a huge damper on everything we're seeing. But at the same time, we also see the main squad finally don the wings of freedom, which has rightfully become one of the most iconic scenes in the entire series. And then that scene of Aaron imagining Marco standing there, also donning the wings of freedom, is a tragic but beautiful send-off to the hero no one ever knew. I mean, even as a viewer, he was just a random side character until we actually learned of what happened. So in hindsight, this definitely hits even harder. It's this constant juggling of tone that I feel like the series has always done incredibly well. And while there are those few wacky early story things and over-the-top anime reactions I've mentioned before, all in all, I do think it's consistently great. Though one of the final scenes see a good old Jean and Aaron standoff. Only here, Jean is the one being dead serious as he tells Aaron to better not mess up because they are trusting their lives in him. A very obvious far cry from all the headbutting between them we saw pre-trust. And the very final scene is just a blatant mirroring of the scouts we've seen. Only this time, it is Aaron who is among the handful of chosen ones and other children are looking up to him. Just like he was way back when. And oh boy, the music here just gives me the biggest chills imaginable. <laughs> Obviously, with Attack on Titan, this uplifting tone is but a ticking timer to everything going wrong. But for that brief moment, there is hope. And with that, the 57th expedition begins, and so does Irvin's big smokescreen. That said, those are episodes 15 and 16. These are very much builders, but I have an inkling we'll be back to single episodes with the female Titan arc. Whatever the case, these ones are a ton of fun to come back to considering just how much scheming there is going on behind the scenes. Which would of course in classic Attack on Titan fashion devolve into complete carnage once we enter the forest. But anyway, with that it is time to venture beyond the walls where we might just get a little more than Irvin bargained for and meet an entirely new type of enemy with a suspicious resemblance to our very own Annie. So, I hope to see you then as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Let's be real here, all of us are just clamoring for the one hour special episode, so I hope this helped tide you over a little. Like I've already mentioned before, these should speed up in terms of releases now that I'm wrapping up some other major projects on the channel, so I hope you're looking forward to that. Plenty more Attack on Titan in the future. 
And be sure to drop a sub to not miss any of those uploads in case YouTube decides that, yeah, we're not going to recommend this anymore. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my rambling, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!